Good morning. Wonderful to see you today. Wonderful to be gathered together, singing together. Uh, sometimes when we switch back to the books, I have to relearn how to read those books. I, I, I skipped, I went straight down and, uh, for the one time we were supposed to repeat the first line, and I went to the second line, and I said, wow, I uh, just, I, I, I guess I need these prompts, I need these helps. Uh, but uh, I caught on, I caught on, so I was there. I was with you, Mark. I was with you. But uh, glad to be here together. You know, this is, uh, this has been a wonderful weekend already. We had uh, so many, I mean, probably 40 women come yesterday morning to be served breakfast by the men. And we had like 50 men too. I mean, it was like incredible. Uh, but that was great. That was a wonderful time. I appreciate everybody who came. Uh, and and this, is a, this is a big week. You know, it's not just today. I know there's a big game today. But, uh, you know, this is the week where we think about the people we really love, you know, romantically love. Get what I'm saying? Uh, that day is this week, folks. And um, it may be that you have a hard time finding that special gift for your loved one. And, um, you know, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in romance. All right. Uh, Shauna might say that. But um, I want to make a suggestion, okay? I know, I know, you're welcome, you're welcome. This gift serves all purposes. It's uh, for all genders. Uh, it, it always fits, you know, you don't grow out of it. Uh, it. It's beautiful. So anyway, we have these for $5. There's a self-checkout stand um, on the way out. Nope. No, no, you don't get a discount. Uh, I know, I know. It feels like, well, do, I, do I work here? What's going on? You know, but uh, it's good to uh, good to. Re we're celebrating. The, the reason I mentioned that those mugs are for our 60th anniversary. This congregation has been here 60 years. Um, none of us were there 60 years ago, uh, but here we are. We are benefiting from God's blessing over all of those years. And uh, we're carrying that forward. We're carrying that, uh, the idea of this congregation forward. And so uh, we're, it's time to celebrate. So uh, we're going to take time to do that. Uh, let's go to the Father in prayer as we begin this lesson. Lord, we are thankful in so many ways for all that you do for us. And as we sang today, we do want you to use us in your service. To help us to go out and to make disciples. Help us to go out and share the joy we have inside of our hearts to simply have the conversations that you want us to have with the people around us, our friends, our family, whoever it is that you bring us uh, into contact with. We ask that the joy of your salvation will be on our lips. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this series uh, I have called Making Disciples, you know, and just looking at his core mission for us, that this is what he has given the church to do. And uh, sometimes you, we could lose sight of what really matters, what is central to what we really do. So hopefully this was a good reminder as we've gone through these lessons. And uh, next week we're going to wrap up uh, our discussion about this. But as we think about this, you know, it comes down to face-to-face -face conversations. And there was a, an amazing song written by Casting Crowns many years ago now. Uh, and I, I talked about it uh, about a year and a half ago in the sermon series where I was gathering from you all the songs that you found inspiring, and uh, that was one of the songs that came through. And it's called Here I Go Again, uh, but this, was, this is the Casting Crowns version, not the 80s rock song, right? Um, and it's a challenging one. Just like almost every song that this group puts out, uh, they want to help the church be better at doing what God has called us to do. That's kind of like their, their main uh, idea of, of, uh, as they write songs. But this is the, the, the situation, and you'll, you'll relate quickly. It begins with a prayer. Father, hear my prayer. I need the perfect words, words that he will hear and know they're straight from you. I don't know what to say. I only know it hurts to see my only friend slowly fade away. So you get the context here. He has a friend, but this friend doesn't know the Lord. So maybe this time I'll speak the words of life with your fire in my eyes. But that old familiar fear is tearing at my words. What am I so afraid of? Because here I go again, talking about the rain and mulling over things that won't live past today. And as I dance around the truth, 
Time is not his friend. This might be my last chance to tell him that you love him, but here I go again. Oh, sometimes you wish you hadn't heard a song, right? And with the music and everything, it makes it so much better. They sing it better than I can say it. But you, you've been there, haven't you? I mean, we've all been there. We've been there with a moment with a friend, and we know that we ought to talk about something uh, more than just, uh, you know, the Super Bowl, you know, more than just the weather outside, but that's what's easy. That's what will just be small talk, and we can be polite, and then we can move on to whatever else we're doing and have fun, or whatever the case may be. And it's these moments, these moments that the Bible says, that's where the, the making of disciples begins to happen. And that's what I'm sending you out into the world to do. I want to talk today about our goal in discipleship making. It's discipleship making goal, um, our habits, and the results. Okay, so the first thing is our goal. The discipleship making goal is simply spiritual conversations. We have conversations all day long with people. And uh, I have probably fewer than you do, strangely enough. You know, I end up stuck in an office reading a book, and you probably had 100 conversations by 10 o'clock. And maybe, you know, somebody walks by and says, hey, Mike, how's it going? And I get to have a conversation at that moment. But usually it's me in the books, right? And at least in, uh, at certain times a day. But to have conversations that take things that extra step, that aren't just about the mundane or about uh, this is what my, my kids are doing or this is what uh, is happening in their school or this is what's happening at work or this is what I can't believe that they're asking us to do this or that. But to take things and take that extra step, that's where we're going to be focused this morning. Uh, Colossians, we looked at this last week, but I reserved the, the use of it again this week. This is Paul writing to the church there. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom with outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Scholars, when they look at Paul as he's writing to the churches, and even as he's moving through Acts, they notice something. And it's something that's slightly different from what you may have heard before. And they've noticed this. Paul will often say, we are out here and we're doing this, you are over here doing something similar, but something slightly different. Paul has in mind, this is the work of an evangelist, but while you are also doing your work, it's going to look slightly different. And so, for example, you know, we have a breakdown here of this very passage. So Paul sees himself and his fellow workers as the evangelists, the ones gifted to go out and preach God's word. Their priorities are clarity in the gospel being alert for opportunities, looking through where God's going to open the door for them. And they want to make bold proclamation. That's what Paul says. Pray that we speak boldly, as God has called us to speak. But he's writing to the people in Corinth, and he's saying, look, you guys, I want you to have the eyes of people who are ready to make disciples. But in your case, I want you to be praying. I want you to have watchfulness. I want you to socialize wisely out there in the world, making the most of the time. And when somebody's asking you, you give gracious answers. Just want to repeat, let's go back to what he says here. Uh, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul's almost seeing the church goes out, and differently than him, because he's not asking every church member to go stand on a, on a street corner and, and, and blast the whole you know, marketplace, or in our case, you know, the, the intersection, uh, and tell everybody, you know, their, their faith. But they, he is saying, but look, for those opportunities that arise, those conversations that you have, be ready with gracious answers. Be ready to share your life with people so that you can also begin to share Christ with them. Peter says it slightly differently. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So 
Peter's concerned is when you're out there in the world, of course, don't do things that are going to bring you know, shame or disgrace on the name of Christ, obviously. Uh, if you suffer out there, don't let it be for breaking the law because that's, that's, you deserve that. That would be stupid. But instead, go out there and give nobody any reason to you know, think that you know, Christ is uh, any, anything dishonorable, that, um, that their slander would, would be worth nothing. But go back. He says, look, go out there ready to give answers, speaking with gentleness, speaking with respect. Uh, one writer said it's leading lives that are questionable, but not in a questionable kind of way morally, but questionable, leading the kind of lives that evoke questions from friends, opening opportunities to share faith naturally. Somebody looking at your life or somebody hearing how you speak and they see something different and they begin to wonder and they begin to ask you questions and you're ready to answer those questions. Or you're ready to say, you know, I believe in the Bible. Do you believe in the Bible? Let's, let's study together. Let's, uh, let's open God's word and, and learn together. Be leading a life that le lets others see you and then begin to wonder why you have the hope that you have. An amazing film was made several years ago called The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith. And he plays the role, it's, it's all based on real life, he plays the role of a man, a father, who has a son and his marriage falls apart, uh, he loses his job, and his money runs out, and he and his son are literally without a home. And he doesn't know when his next paycheck's going to come. He doesn't know if he'll ever find another job. Jim Ice talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He's at the very basics. He's wondering if he's going to have a meal for his son. He's wondering if he's going to have safety at night when they sleep. One night, they go into the public restroom in the subway, shut the door, and lock it. And that's where they sleep for the night. His life is precarious. It is on the edge. And this scene, he's walking down the streets of New York. He's looking for a job. He keeps trying. He keeps trying. He's got his briefcase in one hand. He's got a suitcase in the other. And he realizes how difficult his life is at that moment. But what he sees is a guy pull up in a Ferrari. And it stops him in his tracks. He simply stops and stares at the guy. The guy parks right there in front of the New York Stock Exchange, gets out of the car. This guy has his attention. Now, you might say, well, sure, Mike, I can get somebody's attention if I drive around in a Ferrari and they'll ask me how I get that. Yeah, but that's exactly what happens. You know, the guy parks and you know, his character, Will Smith's character, he goes right up to him and he says, I have two questions for you. What do you do and how do you do it? He wants to know. And the guy says, I'm a stockbroker. And he said, oh, you have to go to college for that? He said, no, not necessarily. You have to be good with numbers, and you have to be good with people. And he just kind of shakes his head. And from that moment, he thinks to himself, I am going to become a stockbroker. That's what I'm going to do. From homelessness to stockbroker is now what's going to happen. And I don't want to give it away, but... Uh, it's a happy ending to some degree, all right? But in that moment, he says, I want to know what you have. Now, I, again, I, I'm not talking about how, you know, we ought to drive flashy cars so people will ask us questions like that. His needs were, as I said, at the very basic. He wanted a life where he could give his son total security, where they could have happiness again, where they weren't having to worry about the next day and the next week and where they're going to have food. And so that Ferrari represented hope. It represented, wow, the, things could be different. Things could be better. What do I need to do? And folks, what you don't realize because you don't think about it in these terms is when your marriage is on display, it can look like a Ferrari to your neighbors. When you go out there and you're, you're getting a promotion because you're honest and you're hardworking and people trust you, it starts to look like a Ferrari, a 1978 red, beautiful Ferrari. And somebody's going to say, why are you different? Tell me. They may look at your children and how well behaved they are, how respectful they are, how they can speak to adults and, and carry on conversations with each other without just, you know, being wild banshees and, you know. And they say, how do you do that? Tell me about your kids. How did you raise children? 
like that. And it's an open door. And Peter and Paul are both saying, that's all you need. All you need is a moment with two cups of coffee. <laughs> two cups of coffee. <laughs> Sorry, that was shameless, right? That was <laughs> shameless plug. And the opportunity to share life, to have a conversation together about where God has blessed you and where you are going. But it only happens when we are ready and we're out there willing to have those moments. Um, Michael Frost is a book I'm going to look at. His, his book is what I'm going to look at here in a second. But he says, if our only habits as Christians are going to church and attending meetings, they're not going to connect us with unbelievers nor invite their curiosity about our faith. Now you're saying, wait a minute, Mike, I thought going to church was good. And I, I, it is. Of course it is. That's why we're here. We're all benefiting from being here. But if that was the extent of it, if that was the extent of our habits, well, then when are those conversations going to take place? So if we have this as our goal, then let's talk about habits. And again, we're going to go back to Frost's book here for four suggestions. Number one from his book, Surprise the World, this is what he suggests. Bless three people each week, at least one of whom is not a member of our church. And we've talked about this before. Maybe eh, I, I look back and it was actually five years ago. But maybe this sounds familiar to some of you. Bless three people this week. These are suggestions where you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'd love to have these moments. I'd love to have spiritual conversations that you know, further things along and they're not just about the weather. The first thing we can do to open those doors is to bless somebody else. Your good deeds shine in this world. This is a dark place. This is a rough place. And while we feel blessing here and we feel happiness here among each other, the world needs what you have. We need to be different people. We need to be people of blessing. A woman like that was in uh, the town of Joppa. Now, there was a, in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. All the widows stood beside him, this is Peter, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. So here's a woman who saw her role as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, as a disciple of his, somebody who was going to spend her gifts on others. She was going to bless others with her talents. And in this case, it was making clothing. So she would make clothing for people who needed it, the people on that low end of those, uh, that hierarchy of needs. Um, this reminded me of Olive Reese. Olive is 102. She's, uh, she's a member here, but she lives in Concordia and Monroeville. I know we've mentioned her many times. But one of Olive's gifts was to crochet. Crocheting, I guess you would say. Um, and she would make baby blankets. And many of you uh, had children, had babies, and you were given a baby blanket by Olive. And I had this idea, and I didn't want to forget it, so I texted her, her niece, uh, Kathy. I said, Kathy, I have this idea, but I don't want to forget, so I'm, I'm setting it to you as an idea. When the time comes, if ever, that we have a memorial service for Olive, uh, wouldn't it be great if we could bring in as many baby blankets as we could find. Or we could at least send photos, you know, for those who are no longer around. And anything that she's crocheted for friends and family. She made these things that, like, almost like, um, I don't know what they are, but they're, they're things that people wear in their wheelchairs at Concordia. And they're all over. They're all over Concordia. They're all over um, uh, Beatty Point, where she used to live. She was somebody who blessed people by her gifts. She saw the idea that blessing people is just what we're called to do, but it also creates opportunities. So, bless three people each week. That sounds like a high number to me, but you tell me. Try it out. Maybe you'll come back and say, Mike, I was able to do one thing. Well, I, I think it's a start, right? Uh, number two, eat with three people each week. Ah, now that sounds a little easier, all right? At least one of whom is not a member of our church. Uh, go out there and eat with people. Sit around a table and talk about life. Amazing things happen when you begin to share meals together. Jesus shared meals with people all the time. Uh, this is where he goes over 
to Matthew's house when Matthew first began to follow him as a disciple. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And I would imagine at that little dinner, they were asking him questions and he was answering questions. We don't get any of those questions. We get questions from people who are on the outside looking in. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus provoked even his opponents to ask questions. And when they did, he was able to say, I have come not for the, the healthy. I, I haven't come for the righteous. I've come for sinners. I'm a physician who's here for those who are sick. He was able to declare his mission to help sinners, to, to you know, bring you know, a, a healing balm to those who needed it. He was able to declare that because he went to dinner. That's what prompted that response from those inquisitive Pharisees. I just find that fascinating. That's part of Jesus' strategy, having controversial dinners. Isn't that amazing? That's great. All right. I'll just, I'll tell you, that's great. But it's Jesus, it's not me. Uh, number three, this is where you kind of would have expected things to go more. Spend one time per week listening for the Spirit's voice, slowing things down, stepping out of the world for a while, stepping into his word, as Jim was telling us to do today. Uh, let God speak to us for a while. The church in Antioch does this with amazing results. Uh, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, start there, right? So they're, they're spending time in worship. They've pulled themselves out from the world, but they've spent time in worship and in fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the church in Antioch is worshiping the Lord, fasting, fasting, and praying. That's kind of how they handle life. That's how they spend life. To fast is obviously the opposite of eating, <laughs> right? You can't do both at once, Mike. I understand. But there's times for eating. There's times for not eating. There's times for refraining and pulling back, telling the food who's boss, in other words. Uh, sometimes we need to tell the food it's not the God of our lives. Uh, and then that helps us get in touch with that God who wants to speak to us, wants to give us some discernment and some wisdom about the steps we need to take. And aren't we all so thankful that they did take that time and the Holy Spirit did say it's time to send out you know, two of the most amazing missionaries the world has ever seen to begin to spread this gospel and make disciples of the Gentiles. And then fourth, spend one time per week learning Christ. We are all disciples of Jesus Christ if you are baptized into Christ. And so it, we need to spend time at the feet of the master. We have to spend time thinking about him, what he said, how he lived, his example to us. Paul is so caught up in who Jesus is, he's willing to let go of his past, of his accolades, of his, um, you might say, his, uh, his Ferraris, right? Uh, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And we need to come back to that day in and day out. Come back to this idea of taking in the knowledge of who Jesus is, what he has done for me, what he is calling me to be as his disciple. So these are four suggestions. You know, it's not, I try to have sort of a practical application for every sermon, but this one, we really needed it, right? Tell us how we can get in there and begin to have these conversations. This is how we can prepare for those moments. And this is how God says, okay, you come to me in prayer, you ask for opportunities, just wait. You know, I, I will give you one tomorrow if you have the eyes to see it. And hopefully spending some time with him, we will have the eyes to see it. So then we move on to discipleship, disciple making results. What will the results be? What will happen if we begin to have spiritual conversations with our friends, with our neighbors? Well, who knows? Now, you, you were expecting me to say, I'll tell you exactly what will happen. Many people will come, and we will fill the baptistry, and there'll be a line, and uh, thousands. We, uh, could be. It could be. But we're dealing with people. We're dealing with people who, at times, uh, 
yeah, they, they respond well. At times, they might not. The things that the guy's afraid of in that song, you know, will this mess up my friendship? Maybe it will. Maybe when you say that they have sin in their life, maybe they'll take offense because how dare you? I, I'm a nice guy. How dare you say, I need Jesus, I need a Savior, when I'm, I'm, I'm so nice. I've been nice to you all this time in our friendship. That's not what I'm saying. And, and then maybe things are messed up. That's, those are things we worry about, right? And so it may be that, yeah, sometimes we might not have ideal results. Notice what happens with Paul. Paul goes to Athens. And Athens is like, he, his, his goal was always to go to Rome. But Athens is like that, that cultural center of the Greek world, obviously. And he gets there finally. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he looks around. He's like, I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, out of my, my zone. I'm outside of what I know uh, as far as my people. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, eh, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Continues. He, he, he's invited to the Areopagus. He's invited to the, the place where they share all these new ideas. And he gives a, a whole sermon. And at the end of that, now when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So here's Paul. And at first he gets to this city and he's like, I'm not even, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do here. I mean, there's just statue after statue, idol after idol. I'm out of place, I'm a fish out of water. So he goes to the synagogue first. Okay, that's a place he knows and begins to speak there. But of course he can't help himself. He's been called to the Gentiles. So he goes out in the marketplace and they say, well, come to the, come to the place where we share all these new ideas. And he goes to Mars Hill and he's sharing with these men. And the result is, well, it's mixed. You see, some mocked, and that can happen to us. We could be mocked. They could laugh. They could say, yeah, 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 I, I, I've heard all that, and uh, that's, that's silliness. I'm not going to believe any of that. Some wanted to hear more. It provoked questions. They wanted to find out more about the resurrection. They wanted to find out more about Jesus, the things that Paul had to share. But some joined and believed. Some responded in a way that said, yeah, all right, I can, I can take this. I can believe this. This sounds like good news that you're trying to share. It comes back, of course, to the parable that we've mentioned a couple times already this morning. Jesus tells it in Matthew chapter 13. He tells it in Mark. He tells it in Luke. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. A whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, as Lee did so well, we usually think about this parable in terms of ourselves. How am I going to take God's word? Because God's word is the seed, and my heart is the soil. And what kind of, where am I right now? Am I good soil? Am I going to receive it? Is it going to produce something inside of me? Am I rocky soil? Am I thorny soil? We can take a look at that. But the same is true when we begin to reach out with the gospel to others. It may be sometimes that that seed falls and it's just rocky soil. Or maybe it springs up for a little while, but it gets choked out by the worries of the world. But sometimes it'll take root. Sometimes people will begin to change. People will begin to turn to Christ, realizing this truly is the source of life. Not that we have it here at Holiday Park. We're not looking to just make churchgoers. 
We're here to help people follow Jesus, to become disciples of his. And we believe he truly has the words of life, as his disciples once said. And so we're called to say, look, we're just going to keep trying. They'll choose how they receive it, but we've got to keep trying. And now, it, 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 more than ever, God's placed on, on our hearts this clarity of, you know, there's lots of things we can get caught up in. There's things we can get distracted by. But right now, to make disciples in this world, it's what the world needs most. Our goal, simple spiritual conversations. Friends talking to friends, talking about things that matter. There's a, there's a saying that is abundantly true. Nobody can criticize your experience. So share your story in those conversations. Share what God has done for you. And they'll take it or leave it. They'll, they'll let it you know, sink in and they'll be able to compare it to their own life, maybe. Uh, but you, know, you lay it out there. You tell the truth about your story. Spiritual conversations. How do we do that? How do we set that up? We just look for those opportunities by having the right kinds of habits. We open up our schedules. We open up our pocketbooks sometimes to, to bless others unexpectedly, but because we're followers of Jesus. Eating with people, spending time listening for the Spirit's voice, spending time learning about the one that we follow. And of course, we wait for the results. The kingdom is a mystery. We don't know. The farmer plants the seed, but he doesn't know all the miracles that are happening with that seed. He simply waits for the harvest, and that's our role. We simply wait to see what God will do as he sends us out. And I can't wait to see it here at Holiday Park. That's the message this morning. God calling us to go out and make disciples, to simply have conversations with people. It's what Jesus does over and over and over again. There was a time when somebody had a conversation with you, showed you, opened up the Bible, showed you how to become a follower of Jesus. It probably involved faith. It involved repentance. It involved baptism. To be lowered into that water, to be raised up again, have your sins taken away. But then have somebody point and say, now continue to follow this amazing master that I'm still learning about. I'm still trying to follow more closely each day. Maybe you're at the beginning of that journey, and you need to have your sins taken away. Have those, those things that would have kept you separate from God, have you instead be brought in as his child into his kingdom, having those sins forgiven. That offer is being made to you today. Come as we stand and sing.